Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's training on recruiting and engaging foster parents in an unaccompanied refugee minor URM programs, focus on strategies for remote services. This training is presented by Switchboard, a one-stop resource hub for refugee service providers in the United States. My name is Tigus Coleman and I'm Switchboard's training officer. I'm joined by co my, my co-host um, today, Rebecca Mulqueen, and you'll be hearing from Rebecca in the chat throughout today's training. I'd like to start by mentioning that today's training will run for about an hour and 15 minutes and that it's been recorded. You'll be emailed a link to the recording along with recommended resources um, in about 24 hours. We'll go ahead and dive right in with a few logistics and Zoom before turning it over to today's speaker. All attendees are currently muted and are joined in listen-only mode. If you're having any trouble, you could switch between phone and computer audio anytime. You'll find the audio settings in the bottom left corner of your screen. We welcome your comments and questions throughout today's session. To do so, Click the chat bubble icon on the bottom center of your screen to open chat. Please send your messages to all panelists and attendees so that we're all able to view your messages. We'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end of today's session, but we would also love to hear your questions throughout. You can type your questions by clicking on the Q&A button. If you choose or if you submit a question that you would also like answered, feel free to upvote it by clicking the thumbs up next to the question. We have received some really good questions from some of you um, during the pre-registration, which we'll also be addressing. Again, my name is Tigis Coleman, and I am a licensed clinical social worker with over 18 years of experience working with refugees and immigrants. Um, I come to Switchboard from Lutheran Community Services, the Seattle office, where I manage the um, unaccompanied refugee minor program, which was a hybrid of resettlement of minors and child welfare. As such, a big part of my role was overseeing the recruitment and licensing of foster parents to care for our youth and ensure adoption-like permanency. I'm thrilled to introduce today's speaker today, um, Alicia Gro. Um, National Child Welfare um, Consultant. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Alicia. Great, thanks so much, Tigus. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm really excited to be with you. I am Alicia Grow, and I'm a, a National Child Welfare Consultant, and I've had the privilege of working in child welfare and child advocacy kind of work for uh, more than 20 years and have worked with dozens of uh, child welfare systems, nonprofit organizations, public agencies, tribes, territories, and other uh, groups and collaborations for many, many years, more than a decade now as an independent consultant, uh, really focusing on foster parent recruitment, engagement, support, um, program development to really strengthen those approaches. So I'm really excited to get to bring what I've been learning to this session and hopefully create space for you all to share with each other about what's working for you as well. So I'm, I'm excited to dive in. We're trying to cover a lot today. So let's go ahead and get started. So we do have several learning objectives for today and hopefully we will be successful in covering all of these for you. We hope that by the end of this session, you'll be able to do several things. So one is really be able to use some new strategies for targeted recruitment, engagement and support for your foster families. I'm hoping that you'll also leave with a specific framework that I'll go over that helps you think about how to tailor your targeted recruitment strategies for your specific needs, for the specific communities you're working in um, and really uh, being able to apply that framework again and again, so it gives you kind of a, a template to follow and adapt as needed. We also hope that you'll be able to incorporate the approaches that we're talking about for recruitment, engagement, and support in these virtual and remote uh, contexts that many of us are still working in and, and probably will be uh, in ongoing ways for a while. And we really wanna help you think about how you can strengthen your efforts to track families through that process, that recruitment to licensure, process. We've heard that that's a big area of need. So I want to share some ideas about how to do that. Let's go ahead and dive in. So first we'll be talking about how to really think about targeted recruitment. And um, we'll go into some key concepts here on the next slide. So a few things I want to highlight, and I think you all are probably already doing so much targeted recruitment that hopefully this feels uh, familiar. 
but some key ideas to think about in terms of doing really effective targeted recruitment. One is what we've seen across, across the decades and across the country is that it's really important to prioritize targeted recruitment strategies more so than general recruitment. Um, most places are finding it effective to have some mix of general recruitment and more targeted. And general recruitment could be you know, broader billboards or sort of broad-based messaging about the need for foster families, but really being targeted to reach specific uh, populations of adults or to highlight the needs of families for specific populations of youth, targeting um, in geographic ways. We'll get into that in a bit more. The more focused you can be, the more effective we see those recruitment strategies being. So really putting the, the emphasis for your efforts when you're recruiting into that targeted kind of bucket of recruitment strategies. We really do see that that's the most effective use of resources, especially for bringing in families sooner. Um, it's also helpful to lay the groundwork with more general recruitment um, and sort of plant those seeds for people to be thinking about foster parenting um, over the years. But when you're having a more specific need or a more acute need to bring in families, uh, that targeted approach really seems to be what we see as the most effective use of those limited recruitment resources. And by targeting your, your messaging and your audiences that you're trying to reach, you're more likely to bring in those families who really will be a good fit. And this helps with managing your internal resources, your response system resources, um, because it's often, hopefully you've seen this as well, when you can bring in more families who are really well aligned with your needs and with the needs of the youth that you're serving, that's a better use of your resources for training and licensing families. Um, so it might mean bringing in fewer overall families, but more of the ones who are really likely to make it through the process and be a really good resource for your youth. And you can think about targeted recruitment as being something you target on multiple levels. And we'll keep talking about that throughout this session. So you can target in terms of who are the people you're trying to reach? Where are they geographically? Where might they gather? What are the messages that'll really resonate with them? And what are the images? And you might have different messaging and, and imagery and approaches for those recruitment strategies across the different recruitment needs that you're trying to meet. So again, we'll get into that a little bit in the framework here in just a moment. Let's move on. So as you think about ways to really target your recruitment strategies for the unaccompanied refugee minor youth that you're serving, you can think about this uh, on, on these different levels that I've mentioned. So one is you can think about what are the characteristics of the youth for whom you need to recruit families. And that can be things like their age, their uh, behavioral needs, their medical needs, um, their language and cultural needs, um, whether they're part of a sibling group and you wanna keep siblings together, all sorts of considerations, but really thinking about who are those youth um, and what do we understand about, about their needs and their strengths and, and what we're hoping to really be able to support for them. And then similarly, you can think about for the families that we're hoping to recruit, for the foster parents, what, what, are, they, what are their characteristics? What are their, um, what's their knowledge base? What are their skills? What are their strengths? What's most likely to be uh, motivating factors that would bring forward really our, our most desired or the best fit um, of prospective parents. So we can think about that and, and then we, and we'll go to this in just a moment, but you know, thinking about who are those potential families that we wanna reach and then what do we know about them and how can we use that to really be effective in our targeted outreach. Geography is another great way to think about targeting your outreach. And this could be um, on various scales. It could be within part of an entire state where you may have a specific uh, need to recruit families or it can be really um, locally targeted like a specific neighborhood or a zip code or within a specific school district or zone. Um, so you can think about literally on a map, where are we trying to find uh, families? And, and that may involve keeping children close to um, other communities that are important to them or keeping other connections or access to services. And then of course, as we've listed all these, you can think about that a way to really do the targeting is to use a combination of those elements. So it isn't just picking one from that list, but you can layer them and think about how do you combine all of those pieces to really have a very focused uh, recruitment strategy or set of recruitment strategies for the youth you're serving. Let's move on. So now I wanna cover this framework that I've mentioned a couple times and we, I'll go over it just sort of conceptually and then we are gonna walk through it a bit um, with some examples. We'll hear from you uh, so we can really apply this in a, a real world setting. So as you think about developing targeted recruitment strategies, we often hear questions about what are the most effective recruitment strategies? 
And we don't have an answer of here's the one thing or here are the three things, you know, the three best ways to recruit families, because it differs across communities, across parts of the country, across the kind of family you're trying to recruit. But this framework is a, a process that you can go through with you and your team to really craft those kind of specific strategies. Um, so these are prompt questions that you can think through and apply to any of your recruitment needs. So you can start out thinking about who specifically are you trying to recruit? And so this can be, who are those adults, those potential foster families that you're wanting to recruit? And it might you might come up with answers to this like Spanish speaking families or families who would be really good with youth with complex medical needs or uh, families who have a real understanding of trauma and the impact of trauma. Um, you may have multiple kind of characteristics like that that you can think about. It doesn't mean you have to know who the exact people are, but what's that kind of uh, general profile? What are the characteristics? So that's one place you can start. Another place you may want to start is this next question, which is for which youth are you recruiting families? And sometimes that's where people want to start with the question and then think about who are the families. So for this question, you might say, well, we're looking to recruit families for um, teens from a certain country or um, youth who've experienced um, multiple losses. You might have different kind of ways that you're understanding the youth for whom you're recruiting families. And that can then inform who are those families that you want to recruit. So these first two questions, you can kind of decide where to start on this, on this framework. And sometimes it's helpful to think about both questions, um, just so you have that clarity of who are the youth that we're really working on behalf of, and then who are the potential families we're trying to find. Once you've done that, then this third question really gets at, to, at that piece of how do we really find the, the kinds of potential parents that we're looking for? So as you think about which adults are most likely to be good leads to be resource parents, be foster parents, who, who are our best prospects? This is where you can get more specific in thinking about the characteristics that they may have. So this can prompt questions such as what skills do they, do they have? Are we looking for people with um, really good understanding of navigating various services? Are you looking for really strong advocates? Are you looking for people with specific language uh, fluency or at least proficiency? Are you looking for um, knowledge from maybe medical fields if you're working with youth who may have medical needs? This is where you can really think about who are those kind of groups of adults that, uh, that might be our best leads. And let's go to the next slide and we'll see the rest of this framework. This is where we really get into that targeting piece. So now that we've thought about, we have a general sense, we've done kind of a profile of the kinds of uh, potential foster parents we wanna recruit, where would we find them? Where do they actually gather, whether actually in person or online and virtually? Where do they get their information? What, what are their, their hobbies? Where do they associate? And this, is, this can feel a little strange to try to project that, but this is something that you often know as you look more at your current foster families and maybe have a sense of many of them um, perhaps belong to certain community organizations or are the families that you're looking for, um, do they tend to live in certain parts of a, of a city or a town? Are there neighborhoods where they'd be more likely to gather? Are there news sources, community newspapers or um, social media pages that you think they'd be likely to follow? Or are they parts of perhaps associations? Are they um, parts of unions or nurses associations or alumni groups from various institutions? So you can think about what are those kind of gathering places, again, virtually or in person, um, where you may be able to find more than just one family that you're trying to find, but where can you find sort of groups of people? Um, if you're looking for teachers or perhaps special education teachers, could you reach them through um, schools specifically, you know, that kind of thinking can help you really figure out how to find them. And then the next piece here is to think about who are the best messengers. And it isn't always us, those of us working in the field. Often it's someone else who might be a trusted member of a community already, a trusted informal or formal leader. Um, so you can think about, or it might be a current foster parent. So think about who can those most effective messengers be to do outreach and then how can we engage them to be partners in that messaging and working with us? Tigas, did you wanna jump in here? Oh. Sure. 
Um, I just wanted to highlight a few examples of at least what we um, had incorporated in our URM program. Like you mentioned, um, targeted recruitment takes creativity and effort to pull off, and it's unique. It's evolving and could also look different for different groups of audience. Um, for the URM program, we knew that the URMs come from over 50 different countries of origin. Therefore, it was really important that we had efforts in place to recruit culturally diverse multi-ethnic families. As such, um, we identified the top few countries that, we, that were dominantly represented, like um, the Dem Democratic uh, Republic of Congo, Honduras, Mexico, Afghanistan, Eritrea, um, just to name a few, and honed in on that community. Successful targeted recruitment does not always mean one way of message delivery. It meant that we had to know the community. We learned the official and unofficial voices, like you mentioned. Um, we, we studied and engaged the understanding of the audience and the communities and how they vibed, right? We connected with our local um, Latino community center and partnered um, and participated in their week-long celebration for the Day of the Dead. We built a relationship with our local Ethiopian and Eritrean community centers and attended their monthly breakfast to observe who the key informants and members of the community were. It also allowed our faces to be seen before we went in with the ask mode, right? We were able to share information about our program and that we did, uh, we did that to a few people before we had a formal presentation to the community. Doing so gave us insight about the community itself. We learned where and where, where and how people gather, right? What traditions and customs uh, brought them together. And we also learned places and connections of discord bet between the members, right? Um, one of the areas and learning opportunities that I had was when I was doing a, the recruitment efforts, I learned um, kind of the I learned um, interesting facts about the, the, the groups itself, about the immigrants and the refugee community within um, the community itself. And like you mentioned, um, we, also had, we also had to know our, uh, our program's um, need, right? Is it licensed home that we need or could we expand it to something that is less licensable, host home situation? Also messaging, you mentioned, right? Messaging of who's doing the outreach, do you have a buy-in with the audience? Do they understand your message? We went in and said foster care, and we understood that some of them did not have any idea about what foster care was because they came from a place where they didn't understand that concept because child welfare didn't exist. So I just wanted to share some technical and practical things that we had to we had used and we um, that we thought was very um, useful for us. That's really helpful. Thanks, Tigas. I think that really brings this to life. And it, as we think about what you just shared, I think it also really ties into this idea of, you know, as we think about who are the best messengers to reach the, the people we're trying to reach, this next piece, this last piece of the framework here is also thinking about what messages and images will really be most effective for reaching and engaging the, the potential foster parents that we're, we're looking to recruit. And I think as you talked, you know, as we think about the more we can understand the, the communities we're trying to reach, the individual uh, family members we're trying to reach, the possible uh, foster parents, the better we can really think about what are the messages that will resonate? What are the images? Um, some of that gets into, you know, what pictures would, would it be helpful to have on brochures or flyers or, or in videos if you're producing those or other online materials, but thinking about how do we really represent um, what it is that we're, we're trying to reflect? So if it's pictures of teens, that's really helpful to think about, but would it, you know, be having an understanding of maybe it's showing images of teens in family settings or in parts of um, community celebrations, whatever we can do to really help kind of paint that picture for people to be able to picture themselves um, in that role as, as foster parents or as host families, if that's um, what you're looking for. So again, that, that deeper understanding of the, the groups you're looking to reach or the, the individuals um, it really helps you tailor that approach to think about what the messaging and imagery is. And one note on messaging, I am not a messaging expert, I'm not a communications expert, but one thing that I always think is important to highlight is when we're doing recruitment efforts, it's really important to frame the messaging in terms of the children you're looking to, to serve, the youth you're serving, 
and the the sort of child and family focus rather than something like our agency needs 50 more families or you know we need we this uh, organization need to need help supporting youth because generally what we hear and i'm sure you see this is that um, people come forward because they're motivated to help youth and they're motivated to support communities less so that they're looking to come forward as foster parents to help an agency meet their goals um, not to say that they don't want to support the agency but really we need to tap into that motivation um, for why they would come forward and uh, pursue becoming a foster parent so that was a quick run through of this framework but let's move on and, and apply this a um, little more directly so we want to hear from you we'll see if any of you have uh, suggestions but if you want to think about a specific recruitment need that you have in your urm program um, specific you know group of of adults you're looking to recruit or youth for whom you're looking to recruit families you can put that in the chat um, we'll give you a moment and see if if you all have a suggestion that where you'd like us to walk through this framework quickly and see how it could apply so see if anything Please. Please type your answers in the chat um, and be sure to send your chat messages to all panelists and attendees so that we'll be able to view your messages. Great. I'm not seeing any coming in yet, but we'll give it a, a moment. Here we go. There's one. Male teens with high behavioral needs. Families for youth from Central America and Mexico. Okay, let's see if maybe we can run through um, a couple of these, I might jump around a little bit in the framework just so we can we can touch on these. Um, th great, I'm, I'm glad to see you all are sharing these. This is great. Um, and I will note that for, for all of you, if you have ideas for recruiting families for any of these populations that you're seeing in the chat, um, feel free to share that in the chat as well. Send it out to all attendees so that you all can be learning from each other. So as we think about this framework, we start with who is it that we're wanting to recruit or who are the youth for whom we want to recruit and so let's uh, I'll start with the the male teens with high behavioral needs just because that was the first one that I saw come in so with that if you if you've got that identified those are the youth for whom you want to recruit families so then we would think about who are the the families who are the potential families the potential foster parents who would be a good fit for for those youth um, and so we can think about characteristics. So first of all, I go to um, people who are good with teens. I think that's always a great, you know, a great way to think about it. who's already working with um, the age group or other characteristics of the group that we're looking at. So people who are good at working with teens, maybe people who are really specifically um, experienced with working with male teens. And so I'm going to just start planting some ideas here. That could be things like youth sports coaches. Um, or people who work at or volunteer at um, youth mentoring programs, like a big brother, big sister, or other kind of mentoring groups where they've already demonstrated that they're interested in um, supporting, supporting teens. And probably at least some of them are then paired in a big brother or in a, you know, a mentoring situation um, with males. So I think that that's those are the kinds of things you can do some of that kind of segmenting to think, how could we reach them. You can also think about um, high school teachers or, or educators, not just teachers in the classroom, but anyone working in high schools or in junior highs um, who'd be interacting with a lot of teens and may have sort of a, a, an extra appreciation of teens um, behaviors and sense of humor and strengths as well as some of their needs. So then if you keep going through the, the framework, you would think about Okay, well, you know, we've, that we've named here some places we might find them. They might be gathering at, um, you know, getting their information from a youth sports league. They might be coaches or assistant coaches or staff. They might be uh, staff at a school where you could do outreach to school staff. But then you could think about what's the messaging that would reach them. And so you think about what kind of motivation they might have. Things like a desire to make a difference and make a positive impact in the lives of teens. Um, something about maybe um, applying their their special skills and knowledge of teens to really help um, address behavioral needs or to help youth be on a good trajectory. You can think about those kinds of things to help frame your messaging um, to really highlight the need for this is a specific population of, of foster parents we need to recruit. And then with that, then you can think about who are those messengers who would be really effective. And again, it might be some of your current foster parents who are working with that population of teens. It might be um, staff in some of these programs, if you could connect with and collaborate with 
a mentoring program or with uh, high schools and see, do they have people there who are really trusted voices or perhaps they could make some presentations or some outreach to help recruit. And they could help you think through what's that imagery? What are the pictures that we should show? Should it, you know, can we show some pictures of um, male teens really being supported? You know, is it that they're out doing activities or working on homework or um, enjoying a meal in a, in a family, but something to really paint that picture of um, what success looks like for these, these male teens with high behavioral needs. So I know that was a very quick run through, but I just wanted to give that as a quick example. And let me see, I wanna go back up and just see if we can touch on, um, let's see here. I know we had a couple comments about um, Spanish speaking families. So I think that's another one, another uh, example that we could run through quickly and think about, okay, so with the framework, if you've identified, we're looking for Spanish speaking families, then we can think about in whatever, whatever area you're serving, your agency is serving, um, where do we think we could reach Spanish speaking families? Are there um, Spanish language media um, outlets in the area where it would be really good to get messaging out? Are there um, neighborhoods where there are maybe specific festivals or are there um, faith communities that offer services in Spanish where that could be a way where you could really say, all right, we wanna target people who are Spanish speaking and we think that they're more likely to be um, high numbers of them gathering in certain places. So you can think about that kind of gathering piece. Where do they get their information? Where do they um, play? Where do they dine out? Where do they go shopping? Um, and I, I, and I wanna be clear that I'm not painting with a broad brush and saying all Spanish speaking families in a certain area would shop at this grocery store, or go to these uh, faith community services. But you can think about where could we uh, target multiple activities or, or gathering places, or again, online venues or newspapers to really get the messaging out. But then also thinking about who are those effective messengers? And are there people that you can connect with? Like Tigus was talking about, are there community gatherings? Are there monthly breakfasts where you can really build that relationship and have that kind of um, investment in engaging broader members of the community you're trying to reach and then listen to them and have them say, these are really the people who are um, our trusted voices, our trusted leaders, whether it's a, a official position of leadership or just really those trusted uh, community members. And could they perhaps help be some of the voice for um, highlighting the need to recruit families? And as you get to know those communities and that also helps you craft that message and the imagery as well. So again, I know that's a very quick um, run through of the framework. We are gonna keep moving on just to make sure we cover everything, but hopefully that gives you a sense of how you can kind of walk through that and it's not that it gives you all the exact specific recruitment strategies, but as you and your colleagues can talk through, it gives you a way to kind of organize your thinking about um, how to brainstorm those recruitment strategies and see what might work. Alicia, I wanted to just um, recognize um, some of the shared needs that I've seen. Long-term foster parents um, versus short-term um, need with specific religious group, example, Muslim um, community, uh, recruiting for nationalities like um, the Eritrean and Afghan. And really, um, it sounds like there's a lot of folks um, talking about short-term um, foster care being um, super hard and emotionally exhausting for our families and how to keep them engaged. So just wanted to recognize and highlight that is a shared need among most of you. Thanks for highlighting that. And again, we encourage you to uh, share in the chat uh, to and have your message go to all uh, participants as well as panelists or all attendees and, and panelists. If you have ideas for what's working for you on recruiting um, for any of the populations, the groups that Tigas just mentioned, it's a great chance to hear from each other. All right, so let's move into getting into the idea of how to do some of this recruitment in virtual and remote contexts. Um, so we'll move on to the next slide. And I just wanna note that as we were planning this, this webinar, this session um, over the last few months, of course, things looked a little different um, than they do now. Things are shifting all around us. Um, we all are adapting and uh, continuing to adjust as we have been over the last 15 months or so, but we still wanna highlight um, some of these, these considerations. So we do have a poll question here. We wanna get a sense of how you have adjusted your recruitment approaches over the past year or year plus. Um, so if you could fill out this poll on, on your screen, hopefully it's popped up for you. You can tell us, have you modified in-person strategies to be in virtual formats? 
Have you developed new strategies specifically for virtual strat uh, virtual settings? So not really modifying your previous in person, but created new recruitment strategies for virtual. Have you stopped your recruitment efforts or none of the above? So give you just about uh, probably 10 more seconds here. You can fill in your vote and then we'll display the results so you all can see how your peers responded to this one. Okay, so the majority of you just barely uh, modified your in-person strategies to work in virtual formats. And then almost a third of you developed new strategies specifically for virtual settings. And some uh, stopped your recruitment efforts. And then for some of you, none of the above. So it, it's a mix. I'm guessing some of you may have done multiple of these things as well. Um, so hopefully that's just helpful for you to, to see in terms of what others are doing. It's also helpful for us to know how you've approached this. So let's move to the next slide. So a couple of things I want to highlight um, as I've been working with a lot of um, organizations and agencies over over the past 15 months, especially and hearing what's been happening as people have made that shift from in person to virtual and other remote um, recruitment and engagement approaches. A couple of key things really have stood out. One is that there were a lot of um, a lot of challenges, especially early on in figuring out how to make those quick adjustments and really shift what had been in person strategies to work in terms of virtual or, or distanced um, approaches, but that there were a lot of successes and a lot of things that worked really well. And I think a lot of, a lot of groups I've worked with have been very, very pleasantly surprised at how quickly they were able to adjust their approaches and how responsive prospective parents have been to those new approaches. So we'll, I'll go into that in a little more detail here in a bit, but we've really seen that um, although it was tricky and certainly we wouldn't have wished to have uh, su such a sudden um, adjustment needed, we've really seen that um, so many agencies and organizations have been really creative and have gotten really positive feedback from potential and current families about how that switch has gone. So I wanna highlight that piece of it. Also, I think we've really seen that in addition to adapting some existing recruitment and response and orientation uh, strategies from in person to virtual that this the the increase in working virtually and the increase in thinking creatively about being remote has provided a lot of new opportunities that really just weren't there for recruitment efforts two years ago or weren't there certainly at this scale so there's a chance to think about creating those new strategies that almost a third of you uh, said you've done and i think a lot of places are looking at how do we keep doing some of those new strategies, even as events and efforts maybe switch back to being more in-person or there's opportunity for more in-person? Um, there are a lot of approaches that I think people are looking to hold on to because of the success they've seen. Let's go to the next slide. So a few things that I wanna highlight again, just to drill down from what I just mentioned, a lot of the uh, child welfare organizations and, um, and social service organizations that I've been talking with and hearing from is that they've actually seen an increase, not just in the uh, participation in initial um, online orientation sessions, you know, not just that sort of first info session, but actually seeing um, increased engagement, increased interaction, questions, um, and increases in the, the percentage of people who are continuing on to the next steps. So it's not just bringing more people in the, the virtual front door for an orientation session and then having them withdraw, but really seeing an increase in that retention rate through the process. Um, and there's a lot of speculation as to why, and that may differ in terms of the experience that your organization has had. But um, that has been a, a pretty common theme is that there's this increased interest and um, and ongoing engagement in the recruitment to licensure process for families. And so I think that's encouraging and it certainly gives us a lot of things to try to explore. And for your, your individual work, it may be helpful to look at that data and whether you're seeing that and try to unpack that and see if you can understand what's driving that. One of the things that we certainly have heard from organizations and agencies as well as from families is that having online events, having things sometimes be live online or just recorded events and, and trainings and sessions, it reduces those barriers to participation for families. They're not having to do uh, transportation to get to a session. They're not necessarily having to make it work at the exact time something is being held as a live event, if they can watch something recorded. 
They don't have to figure out childcare or getting meals done at home before they leave for a, uh, an orientation or a training. So it's making that easier access um, and that, that seems to really be helping break down some of those barriers that families were reporting otherwise. And that's one of the things we're hearing is a lot of places are wanting to continue that even while also then uh, resuming offering in-person sessions. Let's go to the next one. So a few ways you can think about doing your virtual and remote um, strategies for recruiting families and really engaging them. Um, one thing that we, we keep seeing is I think over the last 15 months, certainly, you can really tap into the, the increased focus that people have on keeping people safe, uh, caring for at-risk individuals, especially youth. I think there's this increased awareness about um, vulnerable populations, vulnerable individuals, and how can we really, um, not in any sort of exploitative way, but just really tap into that. That is something that people really are caring about, maybe thinking about more now than they might have a couple of years ago. And so we can have that be part of our messaging as we do online recruitment or as we have virtual events, we can really frame that, you know, there, there are many ways that people can come forward and help, um, help youth and help really um, work towards keeping people safe in multiple ways. Another is that you can think about that word of mouth recruitment that what we always hear that's the most effective recruitment strategy. You can try to formalize that a little bit more and think about as people are uh, continuing to be online quite a bit and being part of various, um, you know, virtual happy hours or virtual community uh, gatherings and virtual dinner parties or just being on social media or part of email groups, you can empower your current families to be doing more of that word of mouth and maybe sharing their stories with, uh, with their networks about why they chose to be foster parents or about what it means to them, but really encouraging people to be part of that word of mouth in a more intentional way and really helping get the word out, um, connecting to their networks. I think it's a way to think about as people are, are gathering um, virtually still or, or doing more online um, interaction, that's a great way to, to really reach more people, including people outside of the service area that you're working in, but that can just help um, plant those seeds for potential foster parents. One thing that we've seen really be effective is looking at this idea of leveraging the new opportunities that are provided with so many online and, and virtual um, gatherings, such as staff meetings or um, alumni club uh, meetings, all of these, these online groups where people are maybe saying they're gonna meet once a month uh, virtually. And previously it might've meant that you would have to get approval to go to drive an hour and present to a group in person and get on their agenda for five minutes and it might not have been worth it for doing a recruitment presentation but if there are um, organizations and you know members of groups and staff meeting virtually you might be able to go on and do a brief presentation about foster parenting or about youth in your community and um, make that a better investment of time but also just know that you're able to to join in maybe even show a brief video or show other um, media that might not have been as easy to do if it were an in-person gathering. So you can look for new opportunities that way. Let's go on. And as you think about this, you can really keep that, uh, that targeted recruitment approach. So you can think about where are people gathering, quote unquote, uh, where are they together virtually or receiving information where you can have a presence. So for social media groups, are there places where it would really make sense to target specific um, people with specific interests, with specific language skills um, in geographic areas, neighborhood groups, but you can really target that increased virtual communication that we're seeing and get your messages out in front of those groups. So it's not just about putting something on your social media presence or in your email newsletter, but think about who's already sending out a, a weekly or a monthly email newsletter or other communication to populations and groups that you'd be looking to reach and how can you tap into that. And another thing I think that's really helpful to think about on an ongoing basis is really to include that trauma-informed messaging in what you put out there, in the information you share. And, I, and that can look a lot of different ways, but as we understand the, the impact of trauma on our youth, we also, I think there's an increased awareness in general over the past year or so about the impact of trauma and what that means in terms of needing to be able to access support services, um, needing to be able to really address mental health needs. So you can, you can tap into that, you can acknowledge that, but also really highlight things like 
um, support services that are available in the communities you're working in and uh, help fo potential foster parents see that um, they would be able to access resources to support the youth for whom they would be foster parents. So you can weave that in and help kind of anticipate some of their not yet asked questions or some of their concerns and um, really help show that you understand what they might be thinking about and highlight resources that are available. So with that, I think we're gonna take a brief break um, as we talk about trauma-informed messaging. Let's all be mindful about our, our own needs. So let's take just a brief 30 second break, take a sip of water, whatever your, your beverage is, stretch, look away from the computer screen for a bit, um, and then we will move the, this, move the slide to the next one when it's time to come back. So just take a moment and uh, do what you need to do for that self-care. All right. So a few more ideas here um, I wanted to share about virtual and remote services. And um, some of this really ties into some things I've already mentioned, but I wanna just highlight this a bit more. So one specific thing that we've seen a lot of groups do is creating their own social media posts. But again, not necessarily just for posting on your social media accounts, if you have them either organizationally or individually, but reaching out to groups where you think they probably have friends or followers or whatever the right terminology is for the specific platform um, where they would be able to reach audiences that you're trying to target. So in some of our earlier examples, could you reach out to um, school groups or youth sports uh, associations and ask them to post something? But if you can create a post, maybe include a great uh, set of quotes or some kind of personal stories, anonymized as needed, but something that really is kind of ready to use. And then your request to them can be, can they share this on their, on their posts and with their networks? It's a light lift for them, but it's a great way for you to reach some of those more targeted audiences. And it get, gets your story and your messaging out to various groups. And you can tailor those messages. That's where it could be a different post that you might ask various groups to do, depending on the population you're looking to recruit or the youth that you're really wanting to highlight as needing to recruit families for. Some other things that we've seen people do are hosting these virtual information sessions um, that might be briefer or maybe more frequent than more formal orientation sessions. And you may already be doing this, but some places have done just a, you know, here's a 20 minute or a 30 minute um, kind of casual virtual information session. We'll share a little bit of information. You can bring your questions. Um, but really making it more of a conversation and maybe feel a little less intimidating, less like a commitment. Um, people don't have to sign up if they don't want to by the end of the session, but just think about ways to make that possible, maybe at various times of the day and the week. So you're reaching people with different schedules, um, but doing that kind of smaller scale um, virtual event, virtual session, we're hearing a lot of success with that. Another thing that we've heard a lot of people talk about um, over the, especially over the last 15 months is tapping into some of the current themes and, and conversations and priorities that are happening um, all around the country or in your, your part of the, the country. Um, especially one, one child welfare system put together a foster parent recruitment campaign with the tagline, you are essential. As there's been so much discussion about essential workers and essential roles in our communities, they wanted to really highlight that foster parents play an essential role as well. That was one specific example. But I think now, especially as I certainly hear so many conversations about um, reconnecting with communities or with your neighbors and uh, the importance of gathering in person and that, you know, that, that human connection, I think there's so many conversations like that and themes that are happening in ongoing dialogue where you can think about how do we resonate with that? How, do, how does our, our messaging and our work fit in with that in an authentic way? So you can think about how to tie in your recruitment messaging and themes 
um, to really be part of what people are thinking about and what's forefront of their mind right now about, you know, reconnecting with family, um, being back out in their communities, participating in events again. I think there's a lot of opportunity coming there. Let's go to the next slide. And so just briefly, I want to tap into this idea. We've talked a lot about virtual approaches, but a lot of this we can also think about, it's not necessarily online. All of this doesn't have to happen on a, a computer screen or a tablet screen. So you can think about remote strategies. What are things that you can do, even if there is still um, social distancing happening, either required or optional? Um, how can you reach people who are, are still looking at ways to stay in safe distances, but maybe, you know, doing online grocery orders and having things delivered or doing curbside pickup at their pharmacy? Um, are there a, a socially distanced events and festivals that are happening where it would really be a fit for you to tie into that focus or the, the target audience that'll be there? And so you can think about, can you partner with stores to have flyers put in um, bags for curbside pickup, for example, or restaurants that might really be working in specific uh, neighborhoods or communities you're wanting to reach? Um, are they doing food delivery? Could you tap into that and partner with them to have them put a flyer on, on the takeout bag? So you can think creatively about how to reach people even if you're not gonna be able to, able to interact with them directly in person or not be able to reach them online, but figuring out where are they going? How are things still happening in those kind of remote contexts? Let's move on. So here, just I know we're we're coming up towards the end of our session, but we do want to have a chance to hear more from you and for you to hear from each other, more importantly. So can you put in the chat window here, um, and again, please send it to panelists and attendees, what's working for you, what's working well, or what has been working well for your virtual or remote recruitment in your programs? So please feel free to share um, things that have been working well. We're not going to ask for uh, the, the evidence or any necessarily evaluation, but just what are you seeing that's that's been effective so far? I see Again, that's a great comment. <laughs> I was gonna say, please be sure to select um, all panelists and attendees before sharing your reply so that everyone can see your great answers. Great. Paid um, Google ads, to yep. get your agency to appear in search results with those keywords. That's That's great. And thinking about that a lot of people probably are doing those searches and saying, how can I help, you know, and what are the needs for unaccompanied minors? So great Zoom information sessions. Yep. The flexibility of virtual options has been helpful. Yeah, that's one of the things that I've heard from so many um, organizations that I've worked with is the flexibility to have sessions at different times. As I mentioned earlier, to have some maybe some live and some recorded. So even if someone's up in the middle of the night or just wants to do an information session but can't get to the exact time, that you're going to broadcast that they can um, they can go get a little more information it makes it easier especially for folks who may not have been thinking about this for as long as some other prospective foster parents if they want to just sort of gradually find out more but maybe not feel like they have to um, make as big of a commitment to show up in an in-person or a, even a live virtual event Mas other things that i'm seeing um news stories, I know that's been a hit, um, that itself is an advertisement, increase in number of families that want to um, information and conduct weekly info sessions, advertisement on the back of the city bus, um, mosques, um, advertising our program, it says, um, flexible online trainings, presentations, virtual platforms to film interviews with current families and staff. Those are, those are all really good um, strategies. Those are great. And I did want to note just that one about using virtual platforms to film interviews. That's one of the things that I think we've also seen a lot is that the power of personal stories is it's always so important in, I mean, in so many things, but especially in recruiting foster parents and that they can tell their story in ways that really reach other people and reach other potential parents. And I think because of the increased use of virtual platforms like this, like other platforms where you can record someone and make a video pretty quickly. It still takes work. I don't want to discount that, but um, it, it reduces the barriers for us to be able to do that. And then you've got this great material that you can use in various ways. We are going to need to keep, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say two really good points that I see that I know we've also used is um, 
reaching current foster parents to connect within their network. I mean, I think that's as good as it gets right there, doing yeah. the talking for us. <laughs> They're modeling it. Um, yeah. Community service church and having current licensed families present at their um, pre-service training sessions. That's great. And I just want to note, I know we had a question come in about, uh, could we give an example of the more formal approaches to word of mouth that I mentioned earlier? So I just want to um, touch on that now, since we had that great comment about reaching current foster parents to connect within their network. I think one way you can think about that more formal approach to word of mouth network or word of mouth recruitment is to, to put a specific request out to your current foster parents to say, you know, we'd love to have you help us in recruitment. And can you share your story or share um, as much as they want to share about, you know, their motivation and, and their experience being foster parents. And you can equip them with talking points if they'd want to use them or data or some, you know, other information if maybe they don't feel comfortable um, just sort of coming up with what to say. You could help support them in uh, thinking about how to do that word of mouth. And even if they're interested, brainstorming with them, what are the groups that they're part of? Who are their networks that they might be able to reach out to um, you know, uh, who should they connect people with at your agency or your organization if someone says, well, how do I find out more? So you can kind of put a structure in place to really um, empower and actively request that kind of partnership with your families to have them do the word of mouth, but understand that they might need a little bit of um, structure from you, like I said, some talking points or some, some um, you know, key pieces of information to share and, um, and for them to know where to direct people uh, if they have more questions. So that's one way you can really think about tapping into those networks in a more um, structured way. I think we do have to move on just due to time here, but I, I'm glad people are sharing in the chat. Um, we also wanted to just see um, if, if there are some new recruitment or engagement strategies that you're thinking about trying, you can put that in the chat as well. And again, send to all panelists and attendees and you can hear from each other, read from each other um, ideas that you all are thinking about trying. And it may be that someone else on this event has already done something similar and would have uh, feedback to share or lessons learned. Um, so feel free to put those in the chat now. I think we are gonna keep moving again, just in the interest of time, but this is a great way for you to connect with your peers if there's something that you're wondering about doing. So we've talked a lot about recruitment, which is the big focus for this event, but I do also wanna to touch on this idea about the response piece and how we engage families after we recruit them. And so this will be just a quick run through of this, but when we think about effective recruitment, really what we see is the, the way that you make it most effective is how you then respond to and engage those families who do contact you. Because once they've done that initial uh, inquiry to you, they're already a, a more likely prospect than the families that you haven't yet reached out in the communities. So let's move on to the next slide and just highlight a, a couple ways you can think about this. With that initial response, whether someone called or emailed or sent a message through your website or came up to a table at an event, you can really think about how do we start engaging them and building a relationship and developing their knowledge from the very beginning. And you can start that process so that it's really a, a partnership and um, a really good communication of looking at, you're wanting to equip families to know more about foster parenting to ask whatever questions they have. Um, and you can think about what's gonna help them feel supported right away. And that, re that relationship building just makes all the difference as I'm sure you know, in whether those families really continue moving forward in the process. Something that's really helpful to do is to think about um, families likely don't know what to expect from this process. You know, what, what are the requirements? What are the licensure requirements for becoming a foster parent? How long does it take? Um, what, are the, what are the expectations for them? What might rule them out? And so the more you can anticipate those kind of questions that they probably have, but may not have formulated or may not have asked, you can help them know what to expect. First of all, that gives them really helpful information, but it also helps them think about, okay, here's, here's how I might be a good fit or not. It helps them self-assess. And it also shows to them that you're anticipating their needs and questions, which goes a huge distance in that kind of engagement. It makes them really feel supported and, um, and understood, which is a, a great way to really build that relationship. You can start out really helping develop their knowledge and understanding about who the youth are for whom you're recruiting families, what foster care is, what unaccompanied mi refugee minor programs are, what the goals are, what 
what successful foster parents do, what that kind of, what that profile is. It helps them see, is this maybe a good fit? Um, or what other questions would they have? What would they need to, to feel like they could be successful? So you can think about that kind of development process as you're helping them do that kind of learning and deeper knowledge building about what they might be getting into, what they may be doing, but also um, assessing their own strengths and whether it's a good fit. Let's go to the next one. And so I've mentioned this here, but I really wanna highlight the importance of helping families self-assess. A lot of organizations and agencies question whether to take an approach of kind of screening in or screening out potential foster parents. And what I and many of my colleagues have seen be more effective is sort of moving away from that choice of screen in or screen out at the early stage and really think about how do you partner with families? How do you equip them to be able to self-assess whether it's a good fit for them? So how do we give them information about who the youth are, what, uh, what the expectations of foster parents are, um, ways that they can really make a difference in the lives of youth, what the, the licensing requirements are. And it's not us trying to get a read on, we don't think you'd be a good fit, or yes, we definitely think you're gonna make it all the way through the process and, and be a great fit. You know, at that initial stage, it's really looking at how do we help have that be a conversation with families and help them get the information they need so they can reflect and self-assess and ask you questions and um, do that kind of exploration process at their pace. You can also really think about what's going to help build that relationship and that trust. I know I keep saying that because it's really important. So how can we empower families? How can we think about what kind of support they need? How can we ask them what would help them be able to move forward in the process? And if they're not ready to move forward in the process, how do we make that okay too? And not say, okay, well, you have to withdraw or move ahead. But you know, if they need to sit for a moment and think about things, or if they're waiting for something else to settle a bit in the rest of their life, how can you provide that support so that they know this is something that they can move forward on um, as it fits best for them and at, at, at their pace? Something else that's really helpful, and I'm guessing many of you do this already, is connecting your prospective families with experienced families, with your current foster families, and with insights and expertise from those families. So whether that's actually making a direct connection with specific current foster families, or just capturing um, insights, or maybe a, a tip sheet or some bullet points on things like, what I wish I had known when I was becoming a foster parent. Um, you could gather that those insights and that wisdom from your, your current foster parents, or uh, tips on things to do while you're waiting through the licensure process. But having that come from your experienced families, um, really, again, it gets to that idea of who's an effective messenger to prospective families, but it also helps those prospective families get a glimpse into um, what the experience is like. And again, whether it would be a good fit for them. Let's go to the next one. So this connection with uh, other families is a, a great message. And I always really wanna highlight the, the power of peer support. And that can be connecting with experienced families as peers, but also connecting prospective families with other prospective families. So that, that group of families who are going through that process and you know, going through the steps of the paperwork and training classes and um, waiting to get licensed, you can really connect them with each other and help them support each other as that peer-to-peer -peer support. And that helps them um, know that they're not alone and maybe in having questions or feeling like things aren't moving as quickly as they'd like or wondering when the next step will be. But it also helps them share information if they say, oh, I found it really helpful to organize my materials this way or I found this great video online that I really appreciated watching. So they can really be a great way to keep having that support but where it doesn't have to come all from you and your colleagues. You can also think about how to make those known waiting periods you know, between various steps in the process more productive and feel more engaging for families. So you can have um, resource lists of here are things to watch or you know, reading lists for, um, for families about sort of the while you wait, here are some things you could do, or here's what you can work on at your home to be ready for the home inspection for licensure, you know, checking smoke detectors and fire extinguishers, um, sharing other, other useful resources like here are community groups that you might wanna know about or, um, here are um, more tips from people who are working, you know, from our staff about things to understand about our youth or restaurants in the community that might be relevant. So you can keep sharing those kind of highlights. Let's move on. Great. 
You can also think about how to do kind of these, these smaller doses of support. Um, so this is something that where it can be great to ask your families what would be helpful to them. Some people really want frequent small check-ins like a text message or an email um, that's just something says something maybe like here here's where you are in the process um, as a reminder you know here's the next step or just thanks for sticking in, in there with us you know we know this can be a, a long wait at this part we appreciate it we're here to help if you have any questions but think about those kind of um, smaller check-ins that can just let families know that you are still still there still working with them even if they haven't heard about um, major progress in, in moving to the next step in the process. And then it can also really be helpful to proactively reach out to, to families if there are media stories or other current events happening that might really be, that might feel relevant, that might raise questions for families. If there, we saw some things in the registration questions about news stories about children at the border, um, that could certainly be something that would get a lot of prospective parents maybe wondering how can I do more to help? Or how can I become licensed sooner? Or just having other questions. So you can think about what's happening in, in the lives of the families and what they might be seeing and hearing and ways that you can help um, kind of proactively anticipate some of their questions and maybe get, just do that kind of check-in. It's a great way to really keep supporting them. Alicia, um, there's a comment in the chat about yep. um, creating a foster parent support group where there's likely monthly or a quarterly meeting among the parents to share ideas and good practices. And that is something that actually we used to do where we have monthly group, we provide very targeted training to help with the URM um, caring of um, the youth and also sharing ideas and more like a support group. So that's a great, uh, that's a great idea, Abdul. It is a great idea. And I think we, I have seen so much all around the country that again, that power of the peer support where you can where you can have, as Tigas was saying, that kind of structured training or presentation or other information sharing that's maybe from staff, you know, from experts, but then also creating that network so that people are seeing there are other there are others going through this same process. It helps them build their support network um, where they can reach out to each other, and whether that's to other families waiting to get licensed or other current foster parents. Um, but creating those peer connections, it's really a powerful way to help people learn from each other, to understand that they're not alone, um, to, to get new perspectives and new insights. Um, it also just really helps normalize the idea of getting support um, and so that if they are at a point where they're at a higher level of need or a crisis situation down the road, um, it's normalized that idea of, I can, I can reach out and connect with support groups and it's not any sort of, it does not reflect badly. It actually is a really, it's a sign of strength that I'm connecting with this group, so. I think great idea, Abdul. All right, let's go to the next one. So I mentioned this at our, with our learning objectives, we want to at least briefly touch on this because I know this was an area of interest for many of you. Um, this question of how you can keep track of families and track their progress through that inquiry to licensure process. Um, and I think the, the short answer is it's really important to do that and there's not just a one size fits all, here's the approach. But um, it, I think it is really valuable to think about having some sort of process in place, whether it's a simple spreadsheet or if you have more robust databases that you'd want to use or a contact management system kind of approach, but have some way to track the families who inquire about becoming foster parents, the families who reach out to you and track where they are in that process. And what a lot of places find helpful is even setting up that kind of tracking system helps make sure that staff internally have agreement about what are these different steps in the process. Um, so sometimes uh, people may have a different sense of sort of whether something is in stage one or stage two or stage three. So you can have that clarity of what are the steps that we, that families would go through, prospective families would go through um, and how do we capture that? And then you can get more robust about that if you wanna think about how long do we expect things to take between certain steps? Um, oh, did we lose the PowerPoint? I'll keep going. Looks like we may have lost the PowerPoint. Um, Rebecca's probably going to get it back up. But, okay. um, All right, great. Well, I'll, I'll keep going. Just, that's um, the, it's our last slide anyway. So, sure. yep. So, as we think about tracking, you can, if you have it on a spreadsheet, you could just have for each family where have they made it to that next step? Did they attend orientation? Did they go to an initial training session? 
um, depending on what your, your organization or agency's system is, there might be other steps that you'd want to note, like filled out the initial application package or submitted the form for the background check or fingerprinting. But you can note that and then really just mark off when that happened. Um, and it's a great way to think about tracking both to see which families are making it through that process, but it also gives you that visual of, are there certain points in the process where families tend to drop off? And there are some places where we would expect them to, like after an initial information or orientation, there's gonna be probably a larger percentage of families saying, okay, I got more information. I've decided I don't wanna move forward with this, at least at this point. That's kind of a known point where you would expect that kind of uh, withdrawal from the process. But if you start seeing things where a lot of families are, are withdrawing maybe after training session number three, and training session number three wasn't one where we get into really complex things or you know, deeper details on trauma or something, if you think, okay, that isn't a spot where we should be losing that many people, well, you can dig into that and say, what's going on there? Is it too long of a gap between that one and the next session? Are we, is something happening at that session that we need to rethink? So it lets you kind of diagnose maybe where there are spots where you'd want to put in some additional support to keep families engaged. Um, but I think a lot of places are really finding it helpful just to set up, even if, if they don't have a tracking system yet, like I said, just a simple spreadsheet or other simple document where you can just see what are those, what are the steps in the process and noting the, the date when families achieve that milestone. Um, it also, if you can track your recruitment source, um, you have a way to then say, are certain recruitment sources bringing in families who are more likely to make it through the process than others? That can be a kind of more robust way of doing that analysis. But if nothing else, um, tracking which families have made it through also lets you go back and maybe re-engage the families who may have stopped or withdrawn earlier in the process. You could do a follow-up in some number of months and just sort of check back in in a low pressure way um, and see if perhaps some of them are interested in re-engaging. That's actually one of my favorite recruitment strategies is the re-engage families who had previously reached out to us but didn't make it through that process and see if some of them are, are now interested in re-engaging. So with that, I think I'm handing it over to you, Tigist, for our, our to facilitate Q and A. Yes, um, it's now time for our Q and A session, and I'll kick us off with a few. I see that there is a few um, questions that have been coming in, but uh, I'll kick us off with a few questions we received during our pre-registration. Most of the questions asked um, have hopefully been answered by the webinar itself. Um, I think Alicia did a great job kind of highlighting most of the questions that came in. Um, I'll start off with one that asks for specific virtual recruitment tools and tricks that are free or low cost. All right, so hopefully some of the things I mentioned already uh, fall into that category, but let me try to underline a, a couple or a couple more. I think one that um, one that I have seen that works really well, and I guess expanding on what I've mentioned before, is partnering with organizations, uh, associations, you know, any of those the community groups that are already having some sort of online gatherings or online communication. So whether it's an email newsletter or they're having a monthly virtual forum, um, connecting with them and seeing if you can if you can join in, if you can be a guest speaker or have a guest post, or even if they don't have time to have you, you know, have a full thing on the agenda, can they share information with their participants? Um, and maybe just have a little, a little blurb about the importance of um, foster parents uh, in their community. So really leveraging other people, organizing those kind of gatherings or having those, those networks. Um, it takes some staff time certainly for you to put that together and to, to reach out to groups and see if you can have those partnerships, but it's uh, at least low cost and, and certainly free in terms of not needing to produce something yourself or you know, hold an event. Um, so that's, that's one. I think also just the, the related piece of that is looking at those kind of social media posts um, creating some content, especially if you can pull in some of those family stories, quotes, uh, that kind of personal messaging from your current foster families, um, or some people find it helpful to get quotes, again, done safely, but quotes maybe from youth and have it be, you know, what it means to them to have foster parents who are caring for them and, and uh, connecting them with their communities. Um, having that be some of the messaging that you can pull together, that can be just kind of a running internal toolkit that you can create, you know, a document or a folder with those kind of pieces of information to then create those um, 
posts that you can share on your social media. But again, if you can reach other networks and have other groups put that out there, I think those are some of the really effective things we've seen. Thank you. Um, we had a question that came in um, today. It says, would recruitment look any different for a new foster care program versus an established program? Ooh, that is a great question. Um, I think the short answer is yes, but now I have to think about what the next part of that answer is. And Tigus, you may have thoughts on that as well. Um, do, you, do you have anything you wanna jump in on or do you want me to take Sure, I can, I mean, I think um, a new foster care program is going to highlight mostly on the psych, psychoeducation of what foster care is, right? What the program needs are, what is, I mean, really driving in the need of what um, the program is gonna be um, needing, right? And I talked about, um, knowing your audience and knowing what your needs are. Is it, and I know there was some chats um, that had some kind of limitations of when and how far um, they could serve their kids, you know, some that are only up to 18 and some that are past 21. So really, what is the need of your program and how do you want to meet that? As far as established program, you know, it is um, hitting it on a lot of the points that you hit, right? It is, you um, diving in and, and having um, your foster parents, your existing foster parents, what connections do they have? Um, what connections of connections could they kind of connect you to so that you can go and speak at their offices or could they host, um, you know, a happy hour or a virtual hour? There's so many different ways that an established um, program could kind of utilize an existing program and or could you stretch it out? And I talked about um, licensed versus a, a, a flexible and more host home like for our youth who did not want to be in a foster or they're in foster care, but they didn't want to be in a um, in in a licensed home and they wanted a semi-independent living style, right? What does that look like? What how what kind of connections can we make um, around that? We also, you know, we also um, studied and found that there were families and there were people that really wanted to help our youth, but they did not want to go through the um, hustle of having to go through the licensing process. So how do we help those people out, out, right? What ways could we connect them? What ways could we pull them into the program? So there is really, um, I, I would say, <laughs> to summarize, it really is knowing what your program's needs are and how to um, go out and knowing what that audience is gonna be looking like. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a great answer. And I would all I would add to that is I think, especially as you think about for those new programs, that a lot of what you may be doing is really first trying to recruit, and I use recruit broadly, trying to engage those kind of community partners. So it's not necessarily being able to recruit foster parents right away on day five or, or day 10, but it might be in recruiting and, and partnering with those community organizations who could then help you recruit. And so it's sort of, I think built that idea of really building that foundation and viewing that relationship building piece as ultimately part of your recruitment strategies. But I think it is then looking at who are those voices who can reach the potential of parents because you don't have that, if you don't already have that established program in that pool of parents. So I yeah. think it's a great way to think about it that it, recruitment in that sense is a little bit more of a, maybe a, a building process. Absolutely. Um, we'll do one more question before we kind of close out. And I think this is a good one to finish. How do you recruit foster parents for nationalities and ethnicities that do not have any community um, represent, representation in the programs um, area? That is a great question. Wow. Um, well, so a, a couple thoughts. Um, I think one is to think about are there are there broader communities that you could reach um, that maybe not may not be exactly the community you're trying to um, recruit for the, the the population the nationality that you're trying to recruit for, but are there broader groups that you could reach who would have um, aligned traditions and perhaps aligned language where you could, you could reach people where if you're thinking sort of in a, a broader lens, um, may still be able to meet your youth's needs, even if it's not exactly the, the population you're looking to reach. That's one thought I have. Tigus, I'm gonna also see if you have anything to jump in on here, because I know you've done more of the, the direct recruitment. Yeah, I mean, I think you've kind of hit it, um, as you can imagine, we have a lot of kids, um, but not a lot of representation of the communities and much of it has, um, We've had to expand our um, our um, 
ask between other programs and other states that may have served those um, communities and seen what they have done, or even connecting them virtually, right? What does that look like? What is the need that they have? Because, uh, for example, the Rohingya was um, the Rohingya or Rohingya, I think I learned that that's how they say it. The Rohingya, uh, when we were resettling them, we had a need, but not a lot of representation within the community. We really had to get creative on how to do that. So we reached out to other states who have resettled the Rohingya Rohingya um, youth and really um, got to learn what their needs were. So really starting with the knowledge and understanding of your audience and your, your, your youth is the start. That's great. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to, um, since we have um, just about a minute, um, I wanted to make sure that we reviewed um, our learning objectives, which are, um, as you can see right here, these are the learning objectives, and we hope that you have now achieved them. Uh, we'll also share and email the list of um, recommended uh, resources along with the link to the recording. Um, before signing off, I hope that you'll take a very short moment to complete our feedback survey. This survey takes less than a minute and it's incredibly helpful for us in improving our training um, going forward. Rebecca is dropping the link to the survey right now in the chat. Um, and depending on how you joined this webinar, the survey itself may already be open in your, um, in your web browser. If not, please click on the link and in the chat and you should be able to access it. Um, again, we'll be sending out the resources um, that you see here. And finally, here is um, Switchboard's contact um, information. I do hope that you'll stay in touch with us and join us for future trainings. Thank you so much again for joining today and a huge thanks to today's speaker, Alicia, and my co-host, um, Rebecca. Thank you again.